This webinar will start shortly in one minute. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Core Data Webinar on making the FBA physician spend numbers talk. My name is Zafar. I am the head of marketing at Core Data, and I will be moderating this webinar for you today. Along with me is Ned Mumtaz, who will be presenting shortly. Ned Mumtaz is a pharmaceutical industry professional with over 18 years of experience working for several pharmaceutical drug manufacturers as directors including sharing, plus research with pharmaceutical, ASI pharmaceutical, and Otsuka pharmaceutical. Ned also provided advisory and consulting services to over a dozen drug and device manufacturing as a consultant for Price Waterhouse and SAP Marika. He is currently leading the compliance analytics practice for Core Data and is part of the team of data analytics and pharmaceutical expert assembling the first global spend and transparency solution. Ned has actively participated in several conferences in the US, in US and EU, where Ned has published several white papers, including um, articles, blogs, and also presented at several conferences. Ned is currently involved in a series of webinars with over 100 pharmaceutical manufacturers participating in some of the sessions. At the fourth annual pharma compliance conference at Royal Garden Hotel in London, UK, on the 5th and 6th of October, Ned gave a presentation on making the FPF physician number spend talk was a, and it was a huge success. The workshop covered uh, very interesting topics including summary of numbers from 2015 FPF disclosure, EU-wide analytics, country-wide analytics, company-wide analytics, and business and compliance consideration. We thought it would be interesting to have Ned speak to everyone else who were not present at this conference. So with that, I would like to give the mic over to Ned. Ned. So far, thank you. Uh, this is Ned Mumtaz. Just want to make sure that uh, everyone can hear me okay. So I'm waiting for a thumbs up from Zafar and team. Um, what I would uh, like to do today is share with you uh, what the spend numbers from FPA transparency reports are telling us. Uh, and my role today is that of the practice lead within Core Data. Uh, and with that, I'll walk into the agenda. Um, so I'll share with you summary of numbers from 2015 FPA disclosure. Uh, I'll share with you what these numbers may be telling us if you look closely. And then I would run three case studies to give you an EU-wide aspect of the numbers that were presented in 2015, a country-wide analytics aspect, and also a company-specific analytics aspect uh, through three case studies. And then lastly, I'll share what business and compliance factors uh, you may want to consider for the year 2016. Uh, I will leave time in the end for Q&A, but I encourage you to please feel free to send in your questions at any time. I'll receive them as you send them, and I'll do my best to address them as they are asked. So in order to, set, to level set on a common understanding, I'm going to my next slide, which speaks about the FBA Transparency Directive, what's at stake when this directive was introduced. So the European Pharmaceutical Industry Association, FBA, uh, wanted to preempt government sunshine regulations in Europe by providing a directive to disclosing transfers of value between healthcare professionals and healthcare organizations and its members in 33 plus countries. Uh, you could look at it as self-regulation by the industry. However, there are specific consent-related requirements to support this disclosure of transfer of value. These come from the data privacy laws in Europe. And it was commonly understood that the rate of consent is the key in success or failure of this directive, failing which the government sunshine regulations in Europe may be imposed. So in this context as well, 
I would like to share the results and the numbers of 2015 reports. A quick summary of numbers from, from this year. Uh, these were certainly submitted and produced in June of 2016, uh, but these numbers were effective for 2015. Um, during this time, press uh, has questioned the rates of consent, and I'll share some of those articles with you. Uh, and also, I'll share some of the numbers that my team and my colleagues have pulled together with respect to the data sets. One quick view of consent ratios. So I want you to uh, focus on a couple of countries. Uh, as I mentioned, in, in terms of uh, case studies, I will focus on a few of those countries. The first one is Italy, which has a consent ratio of around 65%. The second one is Germany at 35%. So I'll come back to these specific ones. But you have a quick overview of consent across the board. Um, from as high as 95% in Latvia to uh, a lower percentage around 20 in Spain. So what are these summary numbers telling us? The Financial Times in UK identified that around 300 million uh, pounds exchanged hands between pharmaceutical manufacturers and physicians and healthcare organizations. And they also shared that around 70% of physicians consented to have their data included. We ran independent analysis and found those numbers to be accurate. Uh, Der Spiegel in Germany uh, reported that around 20,000 of the 71,000 reportable physicians consented uh, with data disclosed by 54 companies that represents around 75% of the market. We again ran independent numbers by collecting data sets and doing analysis on those. And we found that these numbers were largely accurate. And I'll share more specifics with you shortly. But what I want to do next is to apply a slightly different paradigm in assessing the numbers and success of last year's transparency data. Uh, and also share with you what the numbers may be telling us more specifically. But I do want to call out that sometimes averages and generalizations are convenient, but they may not reveal the true nature of disclosure. Because again, I want you to keep the main focal point in mind that the objective of the SPA directive was self-regulation. And part of that was to help the public know about the level and the nature of relationship between manufact uh, drug manufacturers and the physicians. So I'm going to ask you to consider applying a slightly different basis to evaluate the level of consent. Uh, so the numbers that I've shared, the numbers that have been commonly quoted across many uh, uh, of the regulators as well as conference uh, participants has been based on a very simple method or formulation. And that simple method is a headcount of number of physicians who consented compared to those who didn't. So that simple method yielded uh, what you saw around 36% for Germany. In this example, under company one, let's say half the physicians consent to have their spend disclosed and other half do not. So then you would claim that the consent ratio for this company is around 50%. But if you look closer and do a math on the total transfer of value reported for those who consent versus those who don't, and let's say that yields at around 20% transfer of value of out of the total general payments was consented and the other 80% was not, then this will this may give you a pause to think and evaluate that maybe there's more than one way to evaluate level of transparency, and not just by simple headcount of number of physicians. And just to carry out my case, imagine the company too has the same scenario, half the physicians give consent, but then when you apply the formulation of the transfer of value amounts, you find that around 80% of that value was actually consented and 20% was not, 
in that case, you would feel that the level of transparency was actually higher than 50%. And just to tee up my remaining uh, conversation, I'll actually present to you two cases at the country level which reflect some of this type of difference that I just shared with you. Um, so the first case would be EU-wide analytics. Um, what I did in the interest of making the session more palatable is to restrict the data to four countries, uh, Germany, Spain, Italy, and UK. Um, they represent, in general, some of the larger manufacturers uh, that are uh, reflected in those regions. Uh, France is missing. Part of the reason is that the data from France uh, has much more detail. And uh, just to keep the analysis competitive, uh, I picked these four countries. Uh, so at the national level across countries, the ratios and uh, spend priorities begin to tell a story uh, where spend patterns may show a regional focus. And that's what I'll begin to do. So just the level of consent is one way of looking at it, but I'll try to present to you one additional aspect, uh, what the story, transparency and spend story you may see as you do a bit more detailed evaluation. Um, so in terms of total spend, uh, what you would see is that Germany has a larger spend, around 576 million euros, compared to the other other countries. Uh, and the difference is not immense, but still it's noticeable. Uh, Spain sits second at 452, UK third at 315, sorry, Italy third at 316, and UK fourth at 315. And the chart uh, very uh, clearly also represent the same in terms of percentages. Um, so next what I want to do is, and hopefully what you're seeing is that the ratio of consent was was not a factor in the total spend uh, that was uh, reported. The next thing that I focused on was uh, picking on donations and grants. So if you look at the left side of the panel, uh, the dashboard that I'm reflecting, um, I selected the transfer of value type of donations and grants. Um, I was free to pick anything else. I just did that for sake of comparison. And when you do so, certainly UK, which was ranked fourth out of the four countries in terms of uh, their total spend, uh, seemed that they were most philanthropic uh, and most giving uh, when it came to donations and grants. And at 25 million, they topped uh, the four countries. Germany, in this case, came out at the lower end, around 8 million. So the, the relative position uh, completely flipped between Germany and UK. Uh, and all we did was apply a different filter or different focus. Uh, <clears throat> then next thing I looked at was fee paid to the physicians. And at this point, Spain came out on top, uh, and, and not just by a small amount, but really by a large margin. They almost represent 75% of total fee paid to physicians in Spain at 297 million. Um, UK in this case was uh, the lowest at 34 million. And uh, of course, I'm not drawing any conclusion. It would be faulty to do so. But I am going to draw your attention to the fact that we saw very low rates of consent in Spain. And it is arguable and conceivable that um, the 297 million in fees received by physicians would have prompted them to pay close attention to providing consent. Uh, this fact was actually borne out um, in the US as well uh, for the last few years, where the physicians who are most active in reviewing their spend represent the top 20% of spenders uh, within uh, of recipients of transfer of value in US. So there is some correlation one can draw, but again, without true scientific analysis, uh, that causal uh, relationship cannot be established, just presumed. Uh, next, I'm looking at registration fee for 
uh, conferences and symposia. And in this case, Italy had the largest spend uh, at 24 million. So hopefully I did justice in picking the various TOV types so that um, folks from all the four nations are reflected and represented. But I again want to highlight that this gives you an opportunity to recognize at the minimum that there is the possibility of a very local focus on various activities and spend. And if you were to look at this information uh, as a compliance lead and then either set some budgets, set some benchmarks, or simply do comparatives, uh, what you would want to know is how those comparatives vary by location, by geography, and then you can apply those comparatives accordingly and manage your spend budgets, uh, your spend benchmarks uh, in the context of the geographic location you're looking at. Um, the next thing I want to do is I called out that I'll do three case studies. And the second case study uh, that I want to present is around countrywide analytics, right? So now the focus shifts from Europe-wide to countrywide. And I picked Germany as my first case, uh, partly because there was some in-depth analysis done by uh, Der Spiegel. Uh, and um, we found that their analysis, for the most part, was accurate. So that was a nice point for me to tee off and provide you uh, a narrative and comparison. So uh, Der Spiegel mentioned that around 75% of pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry drug manufacturers uh, reported their numbers uh, for 2015, uh, which means 25% of spend data was not reported. Uh, it's noticeable, something that I would come back to in a few minutes. The second thing that uh, the newspaper shared was that around 20,000 uh, of those who reported uh, out of the 70,000 physicians consented. So that's uh, roughly 33%. So, um, conversely, said differently, 66% of physicians did not uh, provide consent, and so their spend was reported at aggregate level, not at the physician level. Um, now, the third data point that I'm about to share is something that uh, core data uh, evaluated, analyzed by going through their database uh, that has uh, comprehensive data analytics and data uh, points available to do an analysis for which you need that de level of detail. And what that analysis says is that from a transparency standpoint, applying the criteria of transfer of value spend, not simple headcount, uh, what you would see is that around 7% uh, of the total spend or transfer of value between manufacturers and uh, the physicians and, and HCOs was in fact visible uh, at the detail level. Uh, and so my goal is to show to you through those details how that number shifts from nearly 33% down to 7%. Uh, but I'll uh, go back to the uh, Spiegel's article for a few minutes, just so that I can provide you greater context, and then uh, switch to uh, that 7% that I called out. So uh, this article uh, titled, Pharma Fee for Doctors, Thanks for Millions, uh, of course, referring to around uh, 500 plus million that was reported, and I'll go to those numbers in a second, uh, calls out that around 71,000 doctors received monies in 2015, uh, and then further elaborates uh, that uh, that represented around 575 million euros um, in across, across 54 manufacturers that reported and furthermore goes on to say that around 20,000 physicians uh, provided consent. Um, another important or noticeable 
element that this article calls out uh, is that the fact that they went through the, the pain to assemble a database just for Germany in order to do this analysis and we can and I can appreciate uh, that if they if data analytics is not their strength uh, it is a lot of work uh, and I am pleased that they did that so that their numbers are, are precise and and just out of interest we used our database to recheck those numbers and I'll share those and, and they were for the most part accurate um, and then the last comment that they made was that um, the doctors were asked uh, whether their choice of drugs is influenced by pharmaceutical representatives and 61% of the physicians said that not at all. Uh, that was based on a survey they conducted with a set of physicians. But they interestingly note that when the same uh, respondents, uh, physicians to the same survey, uh, were asked if their colleagues' choice of drugs is at risk of being influenced by the pharmaceutical representatives, this time 84% of the physicians were of the opinion that it is possible that occasionally too often the choice of drug prescription written by an HCP could be affected based on the influence carried by pharmaceutical representatives. So one could argue this may be the, the holier than thou argument, uh, but another aspect is that uh, maybe it is uh, an opportunity for self-reflection or maybe self-awareness um, because the two percentages are significantly different and noticeable. Uh, of course, the article went on to make the case that there is value, there is significance in having visibility to the spend. Uh, and so from so to that extent, the efforts by FBI are a plausible um, because they are helping address this notion by providing transparency and establishing uh, the, the, a level of trust with the general public. I'm going to go back to the numbers next. So uh, we uh, used our complete uh, and detailed database to evaluate the numbers and indeed the 575 million called out by Der Spiegel uh, is very close to the actual number, which is 576,626,691.69 euros. And also the number of physicians who consented is also uh, acceptable uh, within the rounding uh, uh, percentage of 20,000. Uh, the exact number is 20,368 physicians. So uh, we, I'm just confirming that their data set uh, I, we feel was accurate. That said, uh, let's look closer now at the country level uh, as we apply the transfer of value spend uh, criteria and what that begins to tell us. Right. So I'm just calling out the calculation. The calculation would be total amount of spend for consented physicians divided by total amount of general spend for consented and non-consented physicians and we excluded the research payments from this formula for obvious reasons. So that said, uh, here is the result. Uh, the total euro value based on consent percentage uh, of transfer of value is that the total amount of spend for physicians who consented um, as reported in 2015 was 23 million and 99,253.78 euros. And the total general spend reported by the manufacturers in Germany was 257,848,556.46 euros. When you do the math, that yields around 9%. And then if you recall, um, uh, Der Spiegel had actually called out that 75% of pharmaceutical industry drug manufacturers reported. So I take the 9%, I simply subtract 25% from it because those 25% simply didn't report, which means uh, that percentage of payments was just not available. Uh, that yields around 6.7% as a general uh, percentage or 7% uh, to round it um, to a single digit. Uh, and then I'm sharing with you a scattergram of consent across manufacturers in Germany. Uh, I have concealed the names of individual companies that I will do throughout this presentation. Uh, 
uh, and uh, what you see is uh, levels of consent based on transfer of value spend from zero to near 100% uh, with uh, numbers uh, uh, ranging in uh, all different uh, levels. Uh, so that's, um, that's just a quick analysis and playback for you based on the TOV spend percentage. Now, applying the same country level analysis, if you uh, recall and, and think about the, the case I made that based on headcount versus TOV spend, one company was showing a higher consent ratio based on spend and the second one in that example was lower. So in this case, Germany comes out lower at around 7%, but when I apply that formulation to um, Italy, it actually comes out ahead. So Italy was at around 65% uh, in terms of consent uh, between those uh, based on simple headcount, but when I apply the total value of the, of the TOV reported, transfer value reported, it comes to uh, slightly higher than 90%. So uh, again, uh, from an analytic standpoint, uh, it is important to let the numbers speak. It's important to be objective and have access to those numbers so you can make right judgments and right decisions. Uh, and that once that's done, then you sit in a, in a better spot in how you benchmark your spend, how you budget your spend, and how you manage your spend. So that wraps up my second scenario, which was at the country level. Um, again, I encourage you to uh, send me questions if you have, so uh, I'll have an opportunity to read those ahead of time and uh, look to address those. Uh, the third case study that I wanted to uh, share with you was at the company level. So this is company-wide analytics. Uh, I have uh, intentionally masked the name of the company. Uh, because the main idea is to illustrate how data analytics can help you know the full story and gain insights at various levels, um, region, country, and even company. So first, again, the same uh, initial uh, data set that I shared of the total spend by country. And uh, uh, if you look on the left, you have the opportunity to select a company or multiple companies. Um, and you can select them and look at their activity across whole of EU. And that's what I'm about to do. So I selected a set of companies. Uh, in this case, I actually selected a single company. And what you are now seeing is information specific to that one company across my target set, which is the four countries. And see how that company's spend uh, maps out. And when you look at it, um, in this case, Germany still maps out as the highest spend. Italy and Spain changes position. Uh, and then uh, UK, uh, in, a in terms of percentage, is uh, meaningfully lower. So that's the, just the, the total spend by this manufacturer across the four countries. Uh, next, what I did was I, uh, I looked at uh, the top 10 HCPs uh, and top 10 HCOs for this company. Uh, also, the spend by type looks like research, and sponsorship was the main area of spend for them in 2015. Uh, and uh, I'll call it out I'm, uh, that I'm looking at Dr. Ashley Brown, uh, which was uh, who was one of the top 10 HCPs for this manufacturer. Uh, top 10 in UK because I selected UK in this case uh, just for the sake of uh, presenting an example and I picked Dr. Ashley Brown and I'm looking to understand what is the level of relationship Dr. Ashley Brown has with the industry. So when I apply that paradigm uh, I see that in within UK three manufacturers have spent uh, monies on uh, transferred uh, value to Dr. Ashley Brown in terms of payments. The nature of payments range from fees, service or consultancy, travel and accommodation, and registration fee. And I have the ability to go down to individual level transactions to uh, look at the date, the amount, uh, and that type of detail and the location. And again, I have similar analysis available to me around HCO. 
Uh, and uh, if I when I take the same view, look at the top 10 HCOs uh, and select uh, one of the top 10s and go into the look at the details, I find that Anemco has uh, been engaged by several manufacturers uh, and the main nature of spend has been sponsorship agreements, uh, donations and grants, and then I have access to individual level transactions. So uh, with that, uh, what I want to call out is that uh, there are business and compliance considerations that you may want to consider uh, with respect to the spend data. Uh, what you may want to know is where you stand in the context of the industry by region, uh, across EU, by country, and by the key manufacturers in within the country. Um, in terms of some of the focuses in 2016 across manufacturers, um, what I have learned repeatedly in the last few months uh, through many uh, events that I've had an opportunity to participate is that manufacturers remain keenly focused to incre increase their rate of consent. There is a lot of change that's happening. Um, uh, along with a colleague of mine, uh, Maite Vasquez, uh, earlier this week, uh, we had a webinar specifically on consent management, changes in the regulatory aspect of consent management, and what that means to the manufacturers. Uh, she had shared some insights on SOPs that you want to consider to make sure that you stay on the right side of the privacy law. The fact that there is a new regulation or a new directive around privacy uh, that would be in effect in a uh, year and a half's time and how that might influence. And I had shared some uh, a blueprint of best practices and how best to track, manage, and store your uh, consent data. So from your standpoint, you may want to know your absolute consent by headcount, uh, potentially your aggregate consent by transfer of value, uh, and your nominal consent across the region. Um, some of this data also helps you understand your spend by drug, by device, by specialty, by physician, by HCO, and many other factors that might help you monitor your spend, that might help you track your spend. Um, there is a consistent and constant need for understanding your spend end-to-end, -end, for monitoring your spend end-to-end, -end, and also for effectively comparing your spend against the industry. Um, in the absence of any other benchmark, the industry spend offers you a very good benchmark so that you can compare. Um, Again, I had uh, actually given myself a fair amount of time to answer questions. Uh, I'm going to look at my colleagues to see uh, what questions they have received, and then uh, I'll make an effort to address those in the context of this uh, information that I shared. Uh, I again, I want to uh, thank you for your time uh, to uh, give me an opportunity to share this with you. Uh, and uh, I'll take a quick pause to uh, quickly read through the questions. Hello everyone. Thank you very much, Ned, for this. Uh, I have a couple of questions that just came in uh, from the participants. Uh, one question is uh, from one of the participants, and he has asked, uh, are companies required to provide a way for HCP to revoke consent? Okay, so I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question is, are the companies required to provide facility to revoke consent and I'm presuming and adding this to the question that after the, the transparency report has been published. So I'm going to borrow my learnings from a, a group of attorneys that I've had an opportunity to work with and uh, the answer is categorically yes. Uh, as a manufacturer you are definitely obligated to allow the physician to revoke consent and when that happens, you're obligated to remove the details of spend in a timely manner from your detailed report 
and then move that information and, and those numbers to the aggregated section of your report and republish it. There are three aspects to this response. The first one is those specific countries, and there are five, where consent is not required uh, in order to publish the details, and that's based on the regulation adopted by those countries. Um, there you don't have to collect consent, and by the extension of the same logic, you don't have to manage revocation of consent. However, I want to call out that you need to be careful and keep an eye out for cross-border spend uh, and be prepared to handle revocation in any and every country where consent is required. But for the remaining countries where physician consent is required in order for you to publish the details, you definitely have to accommodate revocation of consent. Uh, you have to accommodate that in a manner that's convenient for the physician. You have to record the fact that the consent has been revoked. And then you have to follow the general pr principle of uh, readily removing the details. There are a handful of countries where the time period for removing the detail is specified in the local code, but uh, across the board, the expectation at the at the region level is that the, the manufacturer will make an effort uh, and be able to demonstrate that in a timely manner they attempt to, to revoke and remove the details. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Ned. I have one more question that just came in uh, from one of the attendees. And the question is, do you have any stats on the differences between consented and non-consented DOVs, like average spend, et cetera? Okay. So I'll repeat the question. The question is, do I have data that can help evaluate consent versus non-consent by the, the type of spend or by transfer of value? So I want to give a little bit of background as a predicate to this question. Uh, this question is predicated on the possibility that a manufacturer may receive consent or allow the physician to provide consent what, using what's commonly called cherry picking, which means the physician may offer consent for, let's say, uh, conferences and congresses that they have attended but may not offer consent for any consulting fee that they have received. So if that is the case, then this question would apply. But what we have seen that nearly 95% of cases, the physicians have either consented or revoked consent. And this is based on our uh, questions and in uh, meetings with manufacturers, the report itself does not clearly indicate if the physician has both consented and non-consented transactions. So uh, even though we have data down to detailed transaction level, uh, but you will have to make certain presumptions to get that uh, percentage, and one would need access to the consent level detail for a manufacturer to respond to that question at the manufacturer level. Again, thank you for the question. Thank you, Ned. Uh, one more question for one of the attendees, and the question is, is it legally required to collect consent on paper in some EU countries, specifically Germany? So. Um, I, I play attorney uh, on television, but I would hesitate to do so from, uh, in terms of providing legal guidance. Um, I'll be happy to uh, relay that question to our legal experts. Um, uh, I mentioned that there was a webinar that my colleague uh, Maite uh, partnered with me on Monday, and that was really focused on consent, forms of consent, collecting consent, 
I do recall that she specifically called out that collecting consent electronically is perfectly legal. She did feel that collecting consent on paper and then preserving the paper was easier and, uh, and, and definitely more reliable. But what I would do is I would uh, definitely relay this question to her. Uh, if you could share uh, your information, then I'll make sure that I, I uh, pass the answer back to you. Uh, and this may be a good opportunity for me to uh, put in a quick plug that uh, Maite would be in a webinar on consent uh, on October um, 10th, I believe. Uh, so if you want to join in and, and ask the question uh, offer directly, uh, then you have an opportunity to do so. Thank you, Ned. I will take one last question. Uh, and after this, we can end the uh, this webinar. Uh, the last question is, do you have EU-wide spend in your database? Uh, Zafar, could you uh, please repeat the question? Sure. The question is, do you have EU-wide spend in your database? I see. So I'm repeating the question. The question is, the database that we have uh, that I use for this analysis, does it contain EU-wide data? Uh, the answer is yes. <clears throat> it contains EU-wide e data, and um, it's based on the uh, level of detail accessible and available publicly at this point. Um, so that's the quick answer. The level of information, the level of detail varies by uh, countries simply in terms of ease of access to that data. Uh, there are, broadly speaking, four sort of scenarios in how countries have reported data. <clears throat> One scenario is where manufacturers reported into a central database. So it's easier to then access that central database and do the analysis. The second scenario is where there is a central <coughs> website where each manufacturer's spend report is linked. And that also yields itself fairly easily. The third is where uh, the, the country uh, uh, association, so for example, pharma industry in Spain uh, and likewise uh, has provided a central site um, for submitting the reports. Uh, that again makes it easier to uh, do analysis and uh, review that data. And then the last scenario is where each manufacturer publishes their report on their own company site. And that in those countries collecting the data uh, certainly takes a little longer. And the level of precision and accuracy can be challenging as the data sets can change uh, on a certain level of frequency based on changes to the consent ratios. So uh, that's the, the detailed answer to the four scenarios, but we have uh, assembled data set across uh, all four scenarios. Thank you, Ned. I have two questions, basically two last questions that just came in from Jeremy. Uh, I don't want to be mean, so uh, I'll, uh, I don't want to leave him out. So I'll go ahead and ask the question that he asked. Um, the first question he asked is, is consent on a year-by-year -year basis? For example, do companies need to see consent every year? That's the first question. The second question is from Jeremy. Has the variability in consent and disclosure led to a change in expectations from FBA or countries in 2017 for 2016 spend? Uh, let me know, Ned, if you'd like me to repeat those questions. Uh, well, I think the questions are clear. I'll start with the first one, and then I'll come back to you, Zafar, to request that you repeat the second question. So sure. the first question I heard was that is the consent, uh, is collecting a consent sufficient for the entire year, uh, and then you need to collect the consent again the next year, or is the consent uh, good enough for an undisclosed period, uh, or is it something that needs to be collected more than once within a year? So I will uh, play back from the learnings I, I got uh, from uh, two different webinars that I partnered with 
legal experts on consent. And my learnings from them, which I'm simply relaying, again, I'm not uh, playing a, a legal expert, uh, just providing information, um, is that the duration of consent can be specified at the point of collecting consent. Uh, arguably, one could collect consent for more than one calendar year. So one could request a physician to provide consent for an extended duration. Uh, so that's, that's the first part. Uh, by definition, then, if you collect consent just for a specific period, let's say six months, then indeed you will have to go back and request consent for continuing to publish spend after that six month period. So that's on the duration uh, and it is something that needs to be specified. Uh, I'll uh, share a variant on that question which is what if there is no time frame specified? Um, so I, I actually had asked the same question of uh, one of the legal experts and they gave me two aspects to that response. The first one was that technically if there is no end date to consent, then effectively that consent remains good for an unspecified period. But their advice was that it would be preferred that one specifically calls out and requires the physician to acknowledge that they are providing consent uh, without an end date. So um, if you are building a system, then a check mark that says that this consent is valid until revoked would then meet that criteria that it was a conscious decision by the HCP to provide consent for an extended period. So hopefully I answered your question. Feel free to ask me to clarify and I'll try to do my best. And Zafar, I'll need your help uh, to call out the second question, please. Sure. So the second question from the same attendee, Jeremy, is, has the variability in consent and disclosure led to a change in expectations from FBA or countries in 2017 for 2016 spend? So uh, right out of the bat, I would say that this is a, a question of opinion. Um, FPI has not come out and uh, to the best of my knowledge, I've, I've been in at least three sessions uh, since the report came out in June of 2016 with FPI representatives. Uh, in, in one case, they gave the keynote address. And uh, essentially, I believe FPI is pleased that the number of manufacturers that have participated um, to report the transparency data has been high. So I think it is certainly uh, from a self-regulation standpoint something to acknowledge, something to really be pleased uh, about the fact that a fairly large number of manufacturers took the directive seriously and made uh, put in good efforts to report their spend. Uh, the second part that FP has called out, in fact, the chart that I shared with you across all countries was shared by FPA, that they saw uh, pretty good rates of consent uh, during 2015. At one point, there were concerns that the rates of consent may be low, uh, but overall, the rates of consent have been fairly reasonable. Uh, the second part to, to the answer is what's FPS focus in 2016 given the rates of consent in 2015 uh, for the, the report that comes out next year in June. Uh, the answer is that FPA has been very keen on advising, guiding, coaching that uh, manufacturers put a lot of efforts to increase the rate of consent uh, in all fairness, the transparency is only as effective, as successful as the rate of consent because providing aggregated spend numbers is better than not having any spend numbers but still is a far cry from providing visibility of 
the level of relationship a manufacturer has with uh, an HCP. Um, so that's that's their focus in 2017. Uh, it is also noticeable that Spain, which had the lowest consent rates, um, reported rates in 2015, um, there the uh, pharma industria uh, actually worked with the local regulators and they have uh, indicated that starting in 2017, manufacturers will have the right to report uh, the spend values for physicians and physicians consent would not be required. So it's anyone's guess how low rates of consent might play out. I feel this is the first of several chapters with respect to transparency that one would see. Uh, but bottom line is, as I think the question implied, that FPI is very keen on uh, helping and recommending that consent be the focus uh, for the 2016 spend year. Thank you, Ned. Uh, I would like to conclude this webinar now by thanking Ned Muntaz for taking his time out and sharing his insights on FBI and consent. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and recording will be emailed to all the participants. Uh, so I would like to thank everyone for taking their time out and listening to us. Uh, I do want to let everyone know that Core Data will be in London at the GCC conference on November 16 and 17. So if you have, if you, uh, have any questions or want any clarification, feel free to uh, approach us at the conference uh, if you will be there. Um, again, thank you everyone for taking your time out uh, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>